Hey adapters, I'm Doug Parsons. I'm a partner at Simpatico Studios where we live stream conversations about complex business and social challenges with professionals like yourself who are working on the same issues. Our shows are live stream in front of a global audience of your professional peers on Simpatico.tv. I'm building a new type of online community for professionals like yourself on the Climate Adaptation Channel. If you're a regular listener of my America Adapts podcast, I think you'll find that we're taking our conversations about important problems, policies, and solutions to the next level here. And if you're interested in being a guest, we'd love to hear from you. And now join us for this latest episode. Hey Adapters, welcome back. Today our returning guest is Ted Ridgeway Watt. Ted is the CEO of TerraLoop, developers of a revolutionary kinetic energy storage system that uses an innovative fusion of electromagnetic technologies. Ted's background is in electrical engineering and computational methods, and his previous appointments have included senior technology strategy roles with the governments in the United Kingdom and Jersey. Ted will introduce us to TerraLoop's grid-scale energy storage system that can sustainably service niche markets difficult to address with the current technology. And we'll talk about the flywheel's unique thin ring design and shares how this enables fast charging without upgrades, storing up to 10 times more energy than a solid flywheel. Hey, Ted, welcome back to the show. Hi, Doug. It's nice to be back. Well, Great look, to be back. look at you. You're in a much different location right now, Lo. So let's just explain where you're at. Where, where are you? So I'm here at the laboratory in Helsinki in Finland. It's 9 p.m. in the evening, but I'm happy to be here for Simpatico and for the Clim Climate Adaptation Channel. I'm here in, uh, in, in, in TerraLoop's laboratory where we um, make real all of the designs that we've done over the last few years. Well, this is a first on so many levels, the first that someone's been on location in a laboratory and just seeing all these equipment. So we at Simpatico are very excited to be doing this with you there. So I think we're going to have a few surprises as uh, the episode unfolds. But you know what? I thought we'd start off with, like, what is a flywheel? Because we're going to talk about your technology, but generally, what is a flywheel? Okay. Um, the flywheel is just a way of converting one form of electricity, or of energy to another. In our case, we turn electrical energy into kinetic energy. So it's, um, think of turning chemical energy into kinetic energy when you eat your breakfast and then you go for a cycle ride. The chemical energy in your body turns the energy into a rotation of a wheel. And uh, that is what a flywheel is. They became popular over 200 years ago with my ancestor, James Watt, who used flywheels to stabilize the power of steam engines and actually harness power for the industrial revolution and we're doing that 200 years later but with modern technology okay i never caught that so you are related to the original kind of watt that the famous watt indeed indeed i am yes i'm a descendant oh. so you could say i was kind of always destined to be in this business Wow, I wish we acknowledged it in the last episode. That's very cool. And look at you, you know, you've taken it to that next level here. I'm sure you would love to explain what you're doing to him, right? Wouldn't that be a fun conversation? Wouldn't it just? But I mean, he would be amazed at how this has come on. I mean, nowadays, flywheels are used in several mission critical applications. So they're used, for example, in data centers and sometimes to protect the, the, the power in hospitals and so on. And the reason they're used in those applications is because they're capable of responding very quickly and producing high amounts of power. And this is something that batteries are not so good for. Um, they, they get hot and the, the heat deteriorates their chemical performance and they lose their service life. And I think most of us have heard this. And anyone with a mobile phone uh, knows that this happens after, say, three, 300 charges. Um, and with big lithium batteries, it might be six to 10,000 charges. But imagine if you're doing that, if you're charging and discharging the battery, several times a day, you know, the, the, the lifetime is decreased. So flywheels have got uh, a real application where you're trying to manage power. And it's this management of power on a minute by minute or second by second basis that we touched upon in the last episode. And this is where the real challenge is. Now, the thing about flywheels is you can't really scale them. If you make a big, a solid flywheel, the faster you spin it to get more energy, and those of you who remember your school days will know it's half mv squared half the mass times the velocity squared but the faster you go 
the more outward strain there is. And the more strain there is, the more likely they are to fail. And what we've done with TerraLoop is we've taken the solid flywheel and we've shaved away the inside. Now that might sound like you're missing the mass and you can't get the energy, but it actually means you're reducing the radial stress. And that means you can spin the thing very fast. And that means you can concentrate the stress around the outside of the flywheel and it's very strong in that regime, in that, in that stress pattern. So that's your flywheel. Spinning it faster. That's your flywheel technology. That's our flywheel. And you mentioned there's Absolutely. limits on size too. Does that design allow you to make it bigger or is there still a maximum size that you have to consider? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I can actually give you a very quick glimpse, um, oh, if you don't mind, yes. Doug, of, of, our, um, of our first prototype. So let me tell you, this is a, rather than a solid flywheel, it's a flywheel that's only a few inches uh, in, in, in thickness, but the whole thing is 10 feet across. I'm translating into, into imperial units. So I'm just gonna pan the mic over. So you can see here, the edge of the flywheel. The, the rotor is only this tiny part at the edge, if you can see that. So it, it's really very thin, but we using this technology, we can store um, from five to 10 times more energy per unit mass. And why is that important? Well, not only can you store more energy, which is always useful as we use more electricity in our energy supply, but it means you lose, use less material. And that's gonna become more and more important as we run through the energy transition and always seek better ways to use the resources that we have. Okay, so explain that to me. What you just showed us, it was 10, 10 feet and it looked more complicated than you're making it out to be, but it, you, it sounds fundamentally, it's, it's a simple design, but let's say that device there, if it's, you know, What's it like a resource to? Like how much could that be? Is it like a building? Is it like a small city? What would, who would use that sort of design that you have right there? Okay, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. But let, let me just tell you briefly um, what you saw there. because You said it looked complicated. Um, the key thing to this is that the, the rotor doesn't touch anything. It's actually levitated by magnets and it's controlled. Its position is controlled by electromagnets, by an active magnetic bearing. And then it's driven by a contactless motor, um, the kind of thing you would find in many uh, modern high-end electrical uh, uh, motors and equipments, like the, um, the famous British uh, designer who makes hair dryers and vacuum cleaners. So um, this is, it's, it's quite common technology. We've just plugged them together in, a, in an innovative way. That means we've got a real, really special product. Now, this 10-foot this rotor, it could, um, this, this, is, this is our prototype. Um, we can't have megawatts of power in the, in the laboratory because we have to consider the safety of our engineers. Um, so this is just a few kilowatts of power. But using our technology, we could make something this size that could, um, that could charge and discharge five megawatts. Now, this is 10, 10 feet across and it's round. If you had five megawatts of batteries, say, this would be between three and five shipping containers quite a different prospect. And of course, this can be buried underground quite easily, um, not only for, for safety, but also, of course, so it doesn't present any kind of visual uh, footprint. All right, so you have a- So a, the answer a, is several buildings. Several buildings, okay. And you yeah. actually have a, a, another little surprise behind you too. Um, let, let's take a look. What, could you explain what's behind you? Let's say it's- Well, this, Doug, you, you've, you've ruined the surprise by oh. saying it's behind you. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So let, let, let me explain. Um, We've got to work on this. Let, I mean, to, to, to just add a little bit of tension to the reveal, um, the, the thing is, where is, where is the, you know, we're a startup. We've been going for six years. Um, and it's a great startup. Uh, and it's usually thriving with young engineers, you know, masters and PhD students and, uh, and a great environment. Um, but we really have to keep an, our eye on the commercial viability of this. And right now, again, as we, we touched upon in the last episode, um, the real pressure in the energy sector during the energy transition is managing power short term. So whilst in the long term, we're going to build devices like this that are, are bigger and bigger and will harness the power of entire wind farms for, for hours and so on. That's not where the market lies at the moment. Um, I want to say we touched on this quite extensively in the last episode. What we need now is something with a very high power density. And so uh, our 
first pilot prototype, the one that will be with a, a major customer over the next few months, um, is behind me. It's right here. All right. There it is. Let's just quickly re-center me. So this, this is, um, I'll explain. Um, this is spinning slowly because it doesn't have its cover on. The cover is just, just to the side. Um, I know you're going to go for a square format, so let me just show you. The cover is currently not on the machine, so it's spinning slowly. Um, now this, what you're looking at here is a carbon fiber rotor that is um, around about three inches in thickness. And it's spinning, um, it's um, just spinning slowly so you can see. It's being lifted by uh, magnetic shear force levitators, which are um, arcane sorcery that, that will um, use very few magnets to provide relatively stable lift. It's being controlled by um, active magnetic bearings developed in-house by TerraLoop. Um, and it's spinning silently and without vibration. Um, at the moment, it's spinning at, uh, I think, 150 RPM. Um, but just to give you an idea, its um, nominal service speed is 6,000 to 18,000 RPM. Wow. Um, at, that, at that level, 18,000 RPM, it's around uh, 12 megajoules. If you, if you want to put that into context, that is um, 12 compact cars traveling at around about 50 to 60 miles an hour. So it's there's quite a lot of energy in there as well. And the reason that this is attractive to the outside world and to our customers is because it's in a very small space. Um, I, um, I mean, this is literally what, um, it's barely two feet across. It's just over two feet across, I think. Um, so the whole thing sits in less than one square meter and we can put a megawatt of power into that. Okay, so g again, give me an example, like that particular uh, product that you have, a mm -hmm. client who would use it in sort of what sort of situation and it, it's is it pretty standalone that you can kind of bring it somewhere and it doesn't require a lot of yep. maintenance how does that all work that's right that's right we can just hoist it up on a lift um with the with the top on and we can truck it somewhere put it down and works so there are two there are two uses for this um this one is actually um, destined to be used by a major um, engineering company a power engineering company and they've made a virtual power plant. So this is a, a collection of um, generating sources like solar photovoltaics or wind power and, a, and, a, and, a, and an array of users, which might be light industry, it might be domestic customers and shops and so on. And the idea of behind this virtual power plant is there's a control system that needs storage to match the supply and demand. Um, and as part of that, um, you'll find that there's quite a lot of fluctuation during the day and the batteries just don't last that long. But if we put this, this is actually only 100 kilowatts, this particular device, um, this, this very one. Um, but if you put that with a one megawatt battery, so one tenth of the capacity of the battery, that could extend the battery lifetime by 20%. Wow. And, and the cost of this against the cost of the megawatt battery means it becomes an extremely interesting proposition. So the return on investment for that is less than two years. So that's why we're selling small devices like this. But the other area that this device will be used or similar ones will be used is in the area of electric vehicle fast charging, which is a fascinating and huge problem for our entire energy infrastructure and our transport and mobility in the future. And the reason for that is, um, Doug, I know we touched on this chatting after the last episode, but if anyone missed it, if you stand at a pump with a diesel or, or, or gasoline and you pull the trigger, uh, the amount of energy in that fuel is such that you're pumping around about 35 megawatts into your car. Now, vehicle manufacturers start to you know, get, get excited, I'm talking about 100 kilowatts. So we're addicted to, to, to molecules, to gasoline products, because the energy is so high. So when we start driving electric vehicles, and by 2040, nearly half the fleet in Europe will be electric vehicles, where is that electricity gonna come from? I mean, fine if you're gonna charge your car overnight, um, it'll cost you less than with diesel, but what if you wanna drive 200 miles? Um, what if you need that last 60 miles to get back home? People are still going to want to charge their cars when they're en route, and we can't just suddenly create um, 
a flow of 150, 200, 350 kilowatts in gas stations everywhere where there's currently a, a petroleum pump um, because they're not wired for it. An average gas station has fuel pumps. Let's say it's got 10 fuel pumps. That's 750 watts each. So that's seven and a half kilowatts. Let's say they haven't been down and bought the latest LED light and they, they've got 10 kilowatts of lights. And let's say they've got a small fast food outlet. An average size um, McDonald's, other brands are available, is around about 50 kilowatts. So you're talking about 60 to 70 kilowatts in total. One ultra fast charger for a car starts at 150 kilowatts. So it's dwarfing the infrastructure that's already there. So we have to find new ways to make the best use of the energy that can be delivered during a day. So this is the other huge area for us, finding innovative ways to manage the cheapest possible way to fill a car, to reduce queues at, at gas stations, to make sure that gas stations can stay open, that they have a viable business, and to make sure that the forecourt and the food court benefit economically as well, and that drivers ultimately are the winners because they're able to drive a car the way they do now, least cost, and most importantly, the least cost to the environment. Well, so those are the two areas. Well, I, I want to talk a bit more about the potential uses of this, and I and I just even sort of what, sure. what you're sharing on your website and such. And so, electric vehicles is an area, but other areas of public transit. What, what do you have in mind? How could it be applied there? And I think you know, electric buses or tra. I mean, what what are some of the kind of bigger modes of public transit? Are you thinking? Yeah. So with the other two areas that we're looking at at the moment, I mean, even for devices this size. So. By the way, you know, I, I, I talked about a megawatt. So this is the 100 kilowatt device and the megawatt device is the same, but this high. Um, we're looking at actually some easier problems than electric vehicle charging, than private passenger vehicle charging. We're looking at ways that light rail, so metros and trams, or, um, uh, streetcars can, um, can um, discharge energy as they break. So they use regenerative braking that goes into storage off the track. And then when they need to accelerate again, they can use the power that was harvested during their braking phase. And that's used already, uh, mostly experimentally, on rail systems from North America through Europe and China. So it's, 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 a, it's a nascent technology, but it's one that's particularly good for flywheels. Because if you imagine a pretty busy station, um, there's a station just north of central Helsinki, of downtown Helsinki, it's called Pazilla. They have 720 trains a day. So that is 720 deceleration and acceleration events. And you can imagine when we're talking about batteries, you're going to be shopping for a new battery pretty quickly if you just use a battery. Of course, flywheel technology is, um, is, is pretty much immune to the sort of harsh, hard power environment that the rapid charge and discharge and the frequent cycle events that you would find in that situation. And the power level is about right, between 100 kilowatts for a, for a small, um, to, to, to aid a small metro, up to, um, up to about a megawatt or two megawatts for light rail. So um, this technology will be applicable in the next couple of years to that. So we're working already with with uh, operators of the infrastructure for light rail and metros and trams to, uh, to make sure that they can build this technology into their future energy saving climate adaptation systems. Um, the other thing you mentioned was buses. And buses, again, for us, they're great. They're very easy. We all know that you know, the bus travels a long way during a day, but it's got a set route and it's got a set timetable. And that means we're able to predict where the bus will need that splash and dash, that two minute top up charge that means it can keep running all day. Um, so again, it's, it's a very interesting area for us and, and one that is applicable to devices not much larger than this. And help me visualize this because I'm still trying to figure out, there's the device, it's not very big at all, but like let's say with buses or the trains, would it be on the bus or the way the electrical system works? It's, it's at strategic locations of a route or something. How does that work? Like the, I, it, it doesn't actually carry it within like a bus, would it? No. Okay. No, I mean, nice. uh, you know, I mean, we have had flywheels in buses in the past. I mean, um, when I grew up, I vaguely remember buses um, in the um, 70s 
1970s, that is, Doug, before you question that, um, uh, using flywheels to help um, to, uh, to sort of to, to, to take some of the strain off the combustion engine. But no, we're talking about putting these at key points, key nodes within the energy infrastructure that means you can make the very best use of, of that, uh, of, of that um, harvested power, that recycled power. Because, of course, um, we, we, um, we recognize that actually you can optimize the way you store energy um, and we can make better use of it if the energy from one train is perhaps used for another. Um, if a train is stationary for two minutes in the station, we can already use, use the energy stored, re recovered from it to, do some, to, to drive another train out. So, I mean, the, the, normally with this what's called wayside energy storage, you're looking at strategic nodes within the local network where you can get the most value for money for the storage, the most efficient service from it. All right, I also- So read, not on buses and trains. So it's just, it's just my ignorance of how the energy system even works. Um, one of the things that I read that I thought was kind of exciting, but maybe you could uh, just provide some more details, it's just the, the role it could play in meeting developing countries' energy needs. And what, what did you have in mind when, when you said that? And I think this, I found this on your yeah, website. Yeah, so yes, I, I, I sent you a few notes and, and, and yeah, it's a very good point. Um, one of, the, one of the, the, the issues that many of us are aware of is that there are uh, many, many people in the world, in the developing world particularly, who do not have access to reliable energy, to reliable power. Um, in fact, there are 600 million people in the world who really need urgent access to a reliable electricity supply for healthcare, for education, for their general well-being. Um, and typically, the, the, the way that grid has been um, um, implemented in the past has not been national grids in those countries. You know, we are countries that have a, a strong and stable uh, grid system are very fortunate. And most developing countries, or many of them do not have that. In which case you have these local grids. They're often built as, as projects and run as projects. And there'll often be a mix of diesel, genera diesel gen sets or diesel generators and solar photovoltaics and other sources. And so already there, you've got a slightly volatile mix of availability and often the solar cells are not very well maintained or they've got battery storage. And actually they need the stabilizing influence of short-term storage. So we talked, I touched earlier on battery life extension where the, where the flywheel can absorb the micro cycles, the, the sudden transients that, that, are, that come upon the, the system. And it's the same with microgrids um, anywhere, whether they're on a, a mountain top village in Italy or, um, or, or a small island um, around um, Indonesia. It's the same thing. It's about managing short-term power outages before you can get a diesel genset on or minimizing the use of such things. So it's really become a very important part for us. And it actually runs through our DNA to make sure that, our, that our, um, both our company and our aspirations and our products and services are as applicable to as many of the strategic development goals, the sustainable development goals as possible. So really looking to, to the future where we can um, get the most benefit to, uh, to, to, to the biggest populations. Um, technically, it's pretty much the same as, as we talked earlier about virtual power plants. It's about matching up of supply and, and, and demand uh, resources. Um, obviously, for us, it's a different business challenge. We need to look for, for, for project work that's funded in a different way. So we sort of go in two directions. You know, there's a part of our company that's um, chasing investment now, always to do it better and faster. We've done all of this on, an, on what is basically a shoestring budget um, in the energy industry. Um, and at the same time, we're, we're trying to, um, to get long-term project work that means that we can um, help out on, on, on really grand challenge problems that, that, um, that uh, unfortunately um, result in continued poverty and, and uh, poor standard of life. All right, so we're at actually the end of our episode here. It just blew by, but I just sort of want to end with you that you'd mentioned about investing a shoestring budget, what you're doing there. You are in the, looking for investors now, sort of upscaling what you're trying to do. What, what, what's going on in that respect? Well, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating business. I mean, it's, it's difficult to get investment from utilities who are the ones who should be investing. 
um, because they tend to be uh, risk averse. Um, so it's incumbent on startups like us to scrabble around and find the support we can. We've had great support so far from uh, Yaskawa in Japan and from the European Commission. Um, and we're looking to expand our, our shareholder base. So we do have an open round. Um, and anyone interested, please you know, come and find us and, and, and come and talk to me. Um, and I think you know, there's a real possibility here for anyone who's interested to actually be able to shift the needle when it comes to the future of the energy transition. Um, all right, but before we close out, I got a question from Mike. It's where can they contact you if they are interested? What's a good way to just kind of get a hold of you? Yeah, they can, um, they can come through, um, they can come through uh, Terra Loop's website, terraloop.com. Um, or um, they, you can uh, yeah, come through there and we'll, we'll, um, we'll connect with you very gladly. Well, and we've mentioned before, we have a wall that we create for this episode and all sort of links and everything. So we'll have, you know, I'll, I'll post something on the, uh, I'll post something there. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Ted, you know, this is such a treat. It's so fun to chat with you. And I, in some ways, I just feel uh, <laughs> how complex the world is, all these cool things that people are doing and the, you know, this t technology that you're developing. It's just really cool. And I, and I, I, you know, I look forward to just sort of watching you guys progress and hopefully we'll have you on again. Maybe there's another specific project you want to work on, but it's, it's been a real treat to be able to interview you. Oh, Doug, do you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to show you. I'd love to give to, to, to have the, 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 the pleasure of showing you our very first electric vehicle fast charging demonstrator. That would be amazing because that will touch everyone over the next couple of decades. So what time frame do you think that might happen? Um... Let's go for quarter one of next year. Okay. All right. We will circle back. Everybody's, and especially Mike, he's the electric vehicle guy, and he, we will circle back around for sure. But uh, this has been great, Ted. Fabulous. And hold on. We're going to go to just chatting, but thanks again for coming on. And thanks for, you know, making this in your lab. That just was an extra treat. Just to look at that thing. That's just, I feel like I'm doing an interview in the future. So <laughs> it's really cool. Doug, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure again. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back.